Hello, and welcome to the TriDoc Podcast. My name is Jeff Sankoff, an emergency physician, multiple Ironman finisher, and your host, the TriDoc, coming to you from beautiful, sunny Denver, Colorado. Some interesting and potentially exciting triathlon news floated over the interwebs over the last 10 days. The City Council of Penticton, British Columbia, voted unanimously to approve negotiations with the World Triathlon Corporation to bring Ironman Canada back from Whistler to its birthplace in the Okanagan District. If it all works out, a five-year deal could potentially be in place for 2020, bringing Ironman Canada back to its roots with a bike course that hopefully would include the iconic Richter Pass, the climb to and descent from Yellow Lake, and one of the most spectacular rides that I have ever done in all my years of triathlon. Now, it isn't a done deal to be sure. Whistler has made a superb host city for both the Ironman and 70.3 races, and there's no indication that Penticton wants any part of a 70.3. Furthermore, I haven't heard or read anything to indicate that Whistler is in any rush to simply let their contract expire when it ends next year. There's no doubt that hosting an Ironman is an extremely costly venture. Estimates are that the burden to Penticton would be almost $650,000 a year for licensing fees and other expenses, and in fact, it was the escalating cost that drove Penticton to sever ties with Ironman in the first place. But as Whistler has found and Penticton came to realize, the returns on investment are not to be ignored. Whistler brings in almost $9 million a year in lodging and dining and generates almost $4 million in wages for local earners during the week of the race alone. Now, for a resort town like Whistler, this may be an average week, but for Penticton, this can be a budget supporter that enables civic spending and drives all kinds of local initiatives. Towns surrounding Whistler have been less than enthusiastic supporters of the race, especially when road closures impacted their communities, but they didn't receive any of the economic benefits. Consequently, the Whistler course has needed to be repeatedly modified to mollify the surrounding townspeople, and as a result, the course has a well-founded reputation as being quite difficult. Unfortunately, this has led to declining numbers of participants, so it may well be that even if Whistler was interested in keeping the race, the WTC may wish to see it move. I think a possible compromise, and something that I'd love to see, is to keep the 70.3 race in Whistler and move the Ironman back to Penticton. Ironman Canada was my first Ironman, and having done that as well as the 70.3 in Whistler, I can attest to the magnificence of both courses as well as the more difficult nature of the Whistler course, though Penticton's course was never thought of as terribly easy. I, for one, would sign up in a heartbeat if Penticton got the race again, and I would bet my bottom dollar that it would sell out very quickly. Here's hoping that things work out so that everyone's happy, the people of Whistler, those in Penticton, and of course the athletes who could stand to benefit hugely from races in both venues. On today's podcast, Tim Crowley is an accomplished triathlon coach to professionals, elites, and age groupers, and he has made a career out of the development and implementation of strength and conditioning training for triathletes as well as in his new role at Florida's Monteverde Academy. He joins me today to discuss the importance of this kind of training and how he leverages it to make athletes of all types and ages stronger and faster and as much as possible resistant to injury. The triathlete Routard visits eastern Canada and my home province of Quebec to explore the 70.3 and Ironman races in the beautiful Laurentian village of mont -Tremblant. This is another spectacular venue to race at and one of the only races where you can indulge in an authentic poutine as a post-race side dish. First, though, I have a medical question to answer. With Memorial Day now come and gone, we are unofficially into summer. And with that, along with longer days, barbecues, and warmer temperatures, comes concerns over exposure to the sun. There's a lot of conflicting information out there about sunscreens, and on this episode, I'm going to do my best to try and help you understand the facts. That's coming up right now. Ah, summertime. When the living is easy, the fish are jumping, and the cotton is high. Now, if you're a jazz fan like me, those words will bring to mind the classic Ella Fitzgerald tune and evoke the hot and humid afternoons when the cicadas are humming and your glass of sweet tea is glistening with sweat, reflecting the late afternoon sun beating down on you from a cloudless blue sky. <sighs> of course, while you lose yourself in the imagery, allow me to remind you that all is not quite so perfect in this slice of nirvana, for the harmful effects of old soul are all too well known to us in the medical world. Sun exposure, you see, is well known to be a significant contributor to all forms of skin cancer, and in the last decade, rates of both non-melanoma and melanoma skin cancers have increased quite dramatically. Between 2002 and 2006, 3.4 million Americans were treated for one of the various forms of the disease, but that number had risen to 4.9 million between the years 2007 and 11. 
Consequently, the costs associated with treatment have more than doubled, from $3.6 to $8.1 billion every year. Now, fortunately, awareness of the dangers of sun exposure have increased over this time period as well, and dermatologists and other physicians have been effective at educating the public of the importance of employing the three primary strategies to mitigate the effects of the sun over the long term. Those are, one, to stay indoors or in the shade in order to avoid sun exposure during peak hours, two, to wear protective clothing, and three, to use sunscreen. Now, the last of these is the subject for my listener question for today's podcast. Sunscreen has been in the news quite a bit recently as there has been a lot of coverage of the negative environmental impact that some of the chemicals used to protect us from the sun can have. The actual question I received was along the lines of, what's the deal with sunscreen? Which I took to mean, how does it work? Is it effective? What are the side effects of using it? And do I need to bother with this stuff? As always, the answers to these questions are not entirely straightforward, but I'll do my best to shed some non-ultraviolet light on each one in order to help you make some more educated decisions. First off, it's probably worth a brief discussion on what it is about the sun that's so bad for our skin in the first place. Sunlight is obviously incredibly important to life on this planet, but along with providing us with illumination by which we can see the world around us, the sun also casts out radiation that is invisible to the human eye, but constantly present and in many ways equally important. At the low end of the frequency spectrum of solar radiation is the infrared radiation that provides the warmth that we so enjoy during the spring and summer months. And at the high end is the ultraviolet radiation that, while important for photosynthesis and is the illuminating light for much of the insect world, is also the problematic type of radiation where our skin is concerned. Ultraviolet or UV radiation expands along a spectrum of wavelengths. At the shorter end are the UVB rays. These rays are the dangerous ones, implicated in the development of sunburns and skin cancers. Longer wavelengths of UV radiation are referred to as UVA rays, and while also implicated in the development of skin cancers, they are less dangerous, though they do have a role in the aging process of the skin seen with prolonged sun exposure. When exposed to sunlight, people with fairer skins are prone to sustaining sunburn, which is simply a radiation burn caused by the UVB rays. Darker-skinned people can also sustain sunburns, but are less likely to do so because of the increased presence of a chemical called melanin. This pigment absorbs UV light and prevents it from causing damage. With exposure to the skin, people with all types of skin, fair or dark, will have increased production of melanin in order to protect against repeated sun exposure. Now, it's well understood that the severity and frequency of episodes of sunburn has a very strong correlation with the development of skin cancers later in life, and so it's extremely important to try and decrease that incidence, especially amongst children. Clearly then, if we as triathletes who spend a great deal of time outdoors training wish to protect ourselves from the effects of the sun exposure, then the use of sunscreen seems like a no-brainer. Well, one would have thought so, but unfortunately, things aren't quite that straightforward. Sunscreens refer to a cornucopia of products that come in all manner of forms of our applications and strengths, but all of which contain one or more chemicals with the ability to absorb or reflect UVA, UVB, or both types of radiation. These chemicals can be organic, such as PABA or benzophenones, amongst many others, or they can be inorganic, such as zinc or titanium oxides. The protective effect of these products is determined by the concentrations of each individual chemical, as well as which chemicals are combined together, and is reported as the Sun Protective Factor, or SPF. SPF is quite simply a reflection of the amount of time that it takes to get a fixed dose of UV radiation when wearing the sunscreen versus when you are not. For example, a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 indicates that it will provide the wearer with protection, such that it will take 15 times as long to get the same dose of radiation than it would take without the sunscreen. Or at least that's the theory, because here's where it starts to get complicated. First of all, though, it's important to note that SPF does not give any indication as to exactly how long you have in the sun before you get to that dose of radiation. The problem is that while SPF 15 will give you 15 times as long without, you don't know how long you'd have to go without to get that same dose of radiation. If the time without sunscreen is one minute, then the SPF sunscreen 15 isn't going to be all that terrific, giving you only 15 minutes. Whereas if the time without sunscreen to get the dose of radiation is 20 minutes, well, then SPF 15 starts to sound pretty good. The problem with SPF is that studies have shown that different labs can measure the same sunscreen and come up with pretty different values for SPF. 
Furthermore, when the same labs are tasked with studying the same products many times over, their results show significant variability as well. In other words, SPF is neither accurate nor precise. Worse, the current standard for determining SPF is to have a product measured one time by one lab. And so based on this study, reported SPFs may have no relation to reality whatsoever, leaving consumers with a false sense of security. Another issue with SPF is misunderstanding by consumers of what the numbers actually mean, particularly when they get up into the higher range. For example, sunscreen with an SPF of 30 has enough active ingredients to block 96% of UV radiation. Sunscreen with an SPF of 50 blocks 97% of UV light. But to block that additional 1% of radiation, there's often twice as much of the active ingredients needed in the formulation of the product. Finally, and this is probably the most important thing to understand about SPF, the SPF is determined by using a fixed amount of product on a small area of skin in the lab, 2 mg for 1 square centimeter of skin. When researchers have looked to see how much sunscreen people actually use in real-life situations, it turns out to be substantially less than that. As a result, while the SPF of the product can be 30, assuming that number is even accurate in the first place, because it's being used in an amount that is so much less than is needed to actually get that value, the actual SPF ends up being far less than what it should be. The end result of all of this is that consumers are not getting anywhere near the amount of protection that they think they are, and this likely contributes to the findings of many studies that have been done over the years on the efficacy of sunscreen in preventing both sunburns and, more importantly, skin cancers. You see, it turns out that the use of sunscreen is actually associated with higher rates of getting sunburned. In addition, many studies have found that sunscreen use is associated with higher risks of skin cancers, which at first blush is completely counterintuitive. Though, I should point out that the literature is somewhat inconsistent in this matter. Many studies have found no relation between skin cancer and sunscreen, while fewer have found a decrease in cancers, so the jury is still out on this important question. Certainly, there hasn't been any obvious and notable drop in skin cancers with the marked use of sunscreen use that has been seen over the last two decades. Now, the reasons for this increase in sunburns and possible increase in cancers with increased usage of sunscreen actually isn't all that hard to understand when you consider the findings of some other studies that track people's behaviors when they actually use sunscreen. You see, it turns out that when people use sunscreen, they get a false sense of security, that they are protected, and therefore tend to spend far longer in the sun than they otherwise would. Add this to the fact that they are not getting anywhere near the level of protection that they actually think they are, and you can see how this is a recipe for a bunch of tomato red folks on a beach. And all of this leads us to the last question that we have to consider related to sunscreens, and that has to do with these chemicals and what they're doing to us in the environment. Oxybenzone is one of the most popular components used in sunscreens, and it has garnered a lot of attention recently because of its harmful effects on the marine environment and its capacity to stick around in high concentrations outside of the marine environment, really all over the place. Oxybenzone tends not to be absorbed through the skin when it is applied in sunscreen, and yet the chemical has been found whenever it has been measured in the blood, urine, and breast milk of humans all over the world. Now, some of this is coming from the inclusion of the chemical in food packaging, where it acts to protect the contents from ultraviolet light and degradation. But most of it is coming from the ingestion of the chemical after it is washed off the skin, where it's contained in sunscreen, and then enters the food and water supply. It's estimated that somewhere between 8 and 16,000 pounds of this chemical is washed off along coastal waters every year, where it has an incredibly toxic effect on reefs, poisoning the microscopic animals that make coral, and being ingested and concentrated in fish that are then ingested by people. In addition, oxybenzone is not effectively removed by wastewater treatment plants, and so treated water that eventually returns to the water supply contains the chemical in varying amounts and then is consumed as drinking water. There's been a slow recognition of the dangers of this chemical, principally to the marine environment. Currently, data is lacking as to its effect on humans, though there are associations with certain gut malformations in developing fetuses that are exposed to it in utero. Local governments in certain island nations and states such as Hawaii have now enacted bans on oxybenzone-containing sunscreens in order to try and halt and hopefully reverse some of the damage that has been seen as a result of this agent getting into the ocean in such large concentrations. The really sad thing about all of this is that of the many chemicals that are used in sunscreens, oxybenzone tends to be actually one of the least effective. 
It has physical properties that have led to its widespread use, but other agents, such as zinc and titanium oxides, are far superior at blocking much wider ranges of ultraviolet radiation and confer far better protection without the environmental impact. So knowing all of this, what is one to do in order to effectively protect themselves from the harmful effects of the sun when spending long hours outdoors during the summer months training for and racing triathlon? Well, there's no doubt that skin cancer is a major issue and continues to grow more common, so preventive measures are critical, and the three strategies that I mentioned earlier remain valid. Stay out of the sun when at all possible, wear protective clothing, and use sunscreen. And that last one is where we might need to modify our current habits just a little bit in order to be more effective and environmentally conscious. Use sunscreens that don't contain oxybenzone, and I'll include a link in the show notes that lists several options that do exactly that. Whichever you use, use a lot of it. Then, reapply a lot more of it frequently. Recognize that sunscreen is not 100% and should not be taken as a license to stay out in the sun for as long as you want under the false notion that you are somehow protected. Do you have a question for me to consider answering on the show? Well, send it to me at tri underscore doc at icloud.com. My guest today is Tim Crowley. Tim has been a triathlete, triathlon coach, and strength coach for 30 years. He's the owner of TC2 Coaching and is the head strength coach at Monteverde Academy, a private college preparatory school in Monteverde, Florida, where he's responsible for designing individual and team conditioning programs, overseeing all rehabilitation programs, conducting nutritional awareness seminars, and fitness education classes for student athletes at all division levels at the school. Tim was a 2008 Olympic triathlon coach and has coached athletes to world championships, Ironman championships, duathlon world champions, and numerous national championships at the elite level. Tim was the 2009 USA Triathlon Elite Coach of the Year and in 2007 the USA Triathlon Development Coach of the Year. He holds the highest coaching licenses in triathlon, cycling, and strength and conditioning. Tim is also a frequent speaker at national conferences and clinics. His articles have appeared in all major triathlon publications. Tim has also had great success coaching age groupers, including one specific tri-doc from a middle of the packer to his first three Ironman 70.3 World Championships over 10 years of working together. Tim, thank you so much for that and for joining me on the podcast today. Hey, you're very welcome. See, I was going to add that last part about you if you didn't do it. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I know that over the time that we worked together, I learned so much from you about the importance of strength and conditioning with respect to becoming a successful triathlete. How do you integrate that philosophy into your work with high school athletes who may be at different levels of physical and emotional development? Yeah, it it honestly really does. It doesn't matter that much. Um, It's really not that much difference, I think, because a lot of the things stay the same with the younger kids. I mean, a lot of it's learning. I think kids, uh, you know, they want to think I just want to be big. I want to be big. And really, our objective there is to teach them. I mean, we tell the kids and the parents when they come to the school is like our objective with our high school kids is not to make them big. One, we want to keep them uninjured. So they're going to be on the field, you know, on the court every day. The second thing is we're going to teach them proper skills. If we teach them good, proper movement skills and lifting skills, then they're not going to get hurt in the weight room, and we're setting them up for later uh, you know, success. And then third is performance. But if we do the first two, and really what I've learned is consistency. And I think that probably is the biggest thing that crosses over with the endurance athletes. It isn't doing a lot. It's not doing you know a couple hours of, of strength work during the winter months. And then when the summer comes, you, you just forget about it. It's really based around you know about two thirty to thirty five minute workouts a week. And, it, and that's actually what began working with the endurance athletes. So when we went to Montvert. I employed that only because we had so many teams. We had so you know a little bit of time. So you basically work on you know keeping the key important things and then throwing out the rest. No fluff and. Um, we do it because of time based, but then when you look at the endurance athletes, the triathletes, it's really the same thing. They have a minimal amount of time, um, minimal amount of energy left after their swim, bike, and run training. So if I can get them to do two 30 minute workouts a week, then that, that's really what we're looking for. And that actually kind of began working with a lot of the elite pros I was working with. They were just so tired and I had to convince them, look, this is really important. So we based it off that. I think if I can get 30 quality minutes out of someone twice a week over you know a long period of time, we're going to see um, you know very good results and it really decreases the amount of injuries. With a, a strength program and a triathlon training program, is it really just about preventing injuries or do you see it as having a bigger role than that? No, it's a much bigger role. I mean, when we look at the injuries first. I mean, if you look at it, you know, I always tell when I'm working with coaches or speaking to coaches, I say, look, we could look at it from performance based or look at it from a business standpoint. If your athletes are injured, what are they paying you for? 
You know, so you need to keep them healthy. But the same thing, if we keep them healthy, we know that they can train on a you know, consistent basis, they're going to get better. Um, the other part of that is that from performance stuff, and it's, it really works on the same way. You know, we get a lot of muscle imbalances that happen in endurance athletes only because of the pattern overload, um, especially when it comes to cycling. You know, look at the amount an athlete is cycling, sitting at their computer. You get all this, you know, upper cross syndrome, forward shoulders, bad posture. So really correcting a lot of that. Plus their glutes are going to get weak by being in a, you know, kind of a flexed hip position. So a lot of it isn't, isn't doing specific movements to swimming, biking and running per se, as much as is doing the opposite movements to create balance um, so that their joints move properly and they're not going to get the typical, uh, you know, overuse injuries. Now, one of the things that a lot of triathletes worry about with uh, respect to strength programs is the idea that lifting weights is going to result in something you said earlier, putting, you know, becoming big, putting on mass. Yeah. So how do you keep or how do you design a program for triathletes that will keep them from putting on muscle mass? All right. Well, the first thing is most triathletes, your typical triathlete, no matter how long they're going to spend in the gym or, ne- or, or do strength work, are probably never going to get big. Um, plus, we know the nature of how much endurance work they're doing. That's not going to happen, especially if you're doing stuff with, a, you know, like, say, a 30-minute program twice a week focused on quality. Now, I think one of the big mistakes people do, and, and I think coaches make the mistake, is, well, it's an endurance sport, you know, so let's give them, you know, low resistance and high repetition stuff. And, and the only thing you're likely to get out of that aside from wasting a lot of energy, is maybe an overuse injury or tendonitis. So really that the science is really clear on this now is it's quality strength. And when we say quality, we're looking somewhere between, you know, the amount of weight you can lift, uh, you know, for roughly between three and 10 reps, say. You know, you start to get below three or four, you're probably risk, you know, putting on much more higher risk to benefit because of the high loads. And then you get above 10, you're really training muscle endurance. And that muscle endurance stuff should be done in specific patterns, you know, swimming with paddles, riding up hills on the bike, you know, hill reps on the run, that type of thing. Um, but when we think of strength, people do think big. And, and a lot of the benefits is going to come from just really the nervous system benefits, learning how, you know, the muscles and everything coordinates to create movement because, to create shorter workouts, you've got to have multi-joint full body movements, which is your squatting, your pressing, your pulling, your hinging. So we're getting a lot of value from, you know, a few exercises. And that's really the key. And I think, you know, what you said is super important. And I want to, I want to restate it uh, in order to emphasize it, because I think it might have slipped past a lot of listeners. And that is the number of reps. And it's the amount of weight that you're lifting should be enough to get you between three and 10 reps per exercise. If you're doing less than that, it means you're lifting a lot more, a lot more weight and therefore you're looking to build mass. If you're doing more than that, then you're looking to not build strength, but you're actually looking to build muscle endurance. So it's really the amount of weight that you're lifting should be enough to, you know, fatigue you between three and 10, but shouldn't be too much to overwhelm you. Correct. Yeah, because what bodybuilders do, bodybuilding isn't lifting heavy weights, it's lifting moderate weight at moderate reps. And that's time where, where a lot of athletes tend to fall into. They're not, not sure. So they'll go like, uh, you know, 12 to 15 reps for three or four sets. That way the weight's moderate. That's what's going to give you the um, the muscle size and muscle hypertrophy, which is what we don't want because it's our power to weight ratio, which is real important. So we want maximal strength for, you know, without additional body weight. Right. And what goes along with that, which I think people often, you know, is, is the key is power. You know, with any sport is power. But the key to power is, is you know, there's a, a force or strength side to it and then the speed. Most people already have this you know, working on the speed. Most people lack the strength side of the equation. Now, the other thing that goes along with, with quality strength, which we, we think, you know, we think strength, we think muscles, is tendons. And building up tendon strength because most you know, most endurance, most triathletes are going to, you know, suffer from some sort of itis due to overuse. You know, a tendonitis is the most typical. So a lot of what we do with quality strength is building your tendon strength. And that's, I think, one of the key things to, you know, uh, you know, prevent aging in, in the endurance athlete. Um, it, again. And then how much is related to diet? Uh, I, you know, I mean, I think you see a lot about bodybuilders, you know, taking in huge amounts of protein and yeah. taking supplements. Uh, right. How much can triathletes prevent putting muscle mass on by, you know, controlling what they eat? Yeah, I mean, the good, the good news is because the amount that they're lifting, they probably shouldn't change their dietary, you know, or their diet that much. Um, probably good to add just from recovery is adding, you know, having a, a bit of protein after you, after you strength train. But then again, you, it's the same thing you'd want after you did a, you know, say a quality run workout or a quality bike workout as well. 
Um, so it doesn't change it much. And because you're doing like 30 minutes, it really doesn't change your caloric expenditure that much. Right. Um, but it does, it does lend itself to leanness because one of the things we want you know, one of the things we see as people get older, their weight may stay the same, but we know that their lean body mass is, is going to drop. And, you know, the number they use is roughly after about the age 30, um, you will lose a pound, a half a pound of lean muscle every year. So that's five pounds per decade. And here's a, here's a funny part, regardless of how much aerobic work you do. So they did studies with elite runners, and, and they found that they still lost lean, you know, lean muscle mass at the same rate as people who didn't. So strength training plays a very important role of maintaining our, our, our overall muscle mass. And we can often attribute this as, as we get older, people tend to get slower. They think that's part of the aging process. And really part of it is the loss of fast twitch muscle fibers. Yeah, and I, I, what you just said is exceptionally important. As you said, there's many studies that show that loss of muscle mass is incredibly important, not just to uh, you know the fact that we slow down, but also to other health problems that develop over time. And it's been shown, as you mentioned, that strength training can help modulate that and mitigate that. Uh, health, tra- uh, sorry, strength training as part of an overall exercise program. It's really important to say. Um, so we've talked a little bit now about how strength training can prevent injuries. You mentioned the strengthening of tendons. What do you do when someone has been injured? How does strength training help rehab from an injury? Well, if you look at it, you know, I think all of our you know, swimming, biking, and running puts our, our, our joints that we're using through a you know, kind of a limited range of motion. So one is when if someone's injured, it's a good opportunity they can you know create workarounds. Like if you've got a knee injury, you can do more you know more upper body work or or even the other limb because we know by training the other limb you're going to get some of that response into the injured side. Um, but as part of the rehab process, I think it's important because you need to regain strength and stability. Um, you know so that when you're out there training, you don't one re-injure this, what, what you just had or worse get something else. And now you start to get into this, you know cycle of injury, which which is very common. Right. How do you modulate strength and conditioning through the course of the year with respect to volume and intensity? Uh, well, that's a, that's a good. There's a, there's a lot of projects I'm working on now, and uh, some stuff will be rolling out in the next six months. But part of it is it's really looking at people way smarter than I am in other sports, uh-huh. <laughs> um, and bringing that in. So basically, I mean, one of the things we, we've been working on a lot is, a, is kind of a kind of a triphasic approach, which is really sounds really technical, but it's not. Because every movement, you have three parts. You've got a concentric where you're moving you know, against the resistance. You've got an eccentric where you're fighting gravity against it. And then you have an isometric when you're pausing in between both. Well, your concentric, which is typically your up phase in most exercises, your intent should always be to try to move it fast. So obviously, if the weight's a little bit lighter, it's going to move very fast. And now we're training for power. If it's heavy, even though it might not be moving fast, we're trying to accelerate it. We're trying to move it. That's where we're going to maximize our strength and power. The other thing is people don't give much thought to the eccentric and the isometric phases, but those are just important. So you can start to manipulate those. So what we do is typically we'll go through a work, you know, kind of a work capacity phase, which is basically your train to train. That's your typical, you know, three sets of six, three sets of eight, three sets of 10. Then starting to build the eccentric because the eccentric is hugely important, especially when it comes to running and long course athletes is that, you know, near the end of a race when you're you're running and your legs are really starting to get sore, that's just because the eccentric load is built up. So doing, you know, eccentric, you know, load, one, we know that prevents injury, but the other bonus is it actually prevents a lot of strength. Um, that's where we're going to gain our, our most amount of um, strength gains on the eccentric phase. So controlling those in various, you know, uh, whether it's two seconds down, three seconds down, four seconds down, can all be manipulated. Um, the other stuff is, is the isometric phase, and those are basically done in two different ways. One is holds and one is pushes. So one of the things I've been working with now is, you know, in those key positions. So let's say if we're, we're swimming, you know, I might use like a like a TRX, and you know, where so I can't move and put an isometric both at the catch phase and the middle of the stroke phase and at the end of the stroke phase. And the nice thing is, when you do isometric work like that, you're going to build strength on about five to ten degrees on either side of that particular point. So we're putting the key points of, of leverage. On the bike, that might be at the you know kind of when you're in that um, you know three o'clock position in your pedal stroke, the port where it's uh, the most powerful, and then the run, the point of contact when you're driving off off the ground. So we've been kind of playing with that and mixing these in, you know, specifically in the programs with really good success. And you do this kind of differently throughout the year, like as the as the yeah. season is peaking and. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. those things would occur like the be- you know, kind of when you start the training year. And then once you get into the, you know, quote, you know, it varies widely. So it's really is no one size fits all because some people might be racing from March through October. But you're really looking at the, where the key races are. And then once we get in a you know, kind of like, you know, probably two months before the first key race, you start to go into like, you know, you know, uh, in season. I don't like to use the word maintenance because we're always trying to get better. But but, you know, in season work. And now we're looking at lower volumes, but we're keeping the intensity fairly high. And there you're going to work off of more of a, you know, kind of a, you know, intensive, you know, intensification phase and then accumulation phase. And all that fancy words mean is intensification is we're keeping our reps low and maybe we're doing more sets. So we might be doing like four sets of three, four sets of four. It quality is high. And then other times we might be during accumulation phase. We can still keep intensity by doing stuff like clusters. And what a cluster would be is like subsets. So I could do a fairly high heavy weight, but I could go. Three reps, rest 10 seconds, three reps, rest 10, three reps, rest 10. I get nine reps total, but we've, we've kept the intensity higher than if I just did a straight nine. Um, and again, it varies widely between person to person. It depends on what, what we're particularly working on. But we really don't back off much until you know probably a, a week or so before, a week to two weeks before key races. But it depends how many A races they have throughout the year. Okay. And how about as an athlete ages? How do you... How do you look at strength and conditioning for the older athlete? Uh, well, first, that probably depends more on their. You know, I look at first is look at their training age. The first thing I find out is like, you know, you're just beginning. So if they're just beginning and they're in their 40s, we're still going to treat it like it would anybody else just beginning. The difference, though, when people get older, just going to realize that. One, if they get an injury, it's going to take longer to heal, and two, their rate of adaptation is going to be lengthened out a little bit. Um, but they can still train intently. You just, you know, I say as people get older, the margin of error just gets slimmer. So you got to be dead on. Um, so good communication with the athlete, really watching their, you know, looking at their skills, making sure that they, they are really good at what they're doing will minimize a lot of, um, you know, potential injuries. Now, Tim, I know that uh, you uh, advocate strongly for the use of the VASA swim ergometer. Uh, how do you utilize that as a, a strength modality and I, I having used one i definitely think of it as a strength modality well i think yeah i think it fits in the continuum really well i mean there's a lot of ways that we use it um we'll use it in between um sets so you can do like a, you know a strength exercise 30 seconds of, of swimming on there come back and use it in all different ways we can do the specific strength working because if you think of strength as a long continuum where you've got weight room strength and then we've got you know specific strength which would be like riding hills swimming under resistance the vasa fits perfectly into there uh, or power based stuff so we get this long continuum we can move back and forth but i find it indispensable both for you know for people coming shoulder injuries um you know and really dial in that strength specific you know which i think a lot of triathletes lack when they get in open water um so i think it'd be a, it's a great piece we, you know, we talked about isometric work earlier and you know, I use it a lot for uh, isometric work and eccentric work, using both the ergometer but also the VASA trainer, which is the body weight one. Now, it's interesting. I, I have found the VASA to be a very interesting tool because as I've become more proficient with swimming, I have recognized that my stroke on the VASA is not the same as my stroke in the water. So how do you sort of tell people, specifically people who are, you know, like not as proficient swimmers to Mm -hmm. utilize the VASA in a way that will, you know, not necessarily adversely affect their stroke in the water. Yeah. The first thing I do is I, I always tell people never don't come over the top, like with your recovery of your stroke, because it just puts your shoulder into an impingement. One of the beauties of that is you can come with an underwater recovery. So we're not adding any extra stress. Um, the other big thing is it allows you to, you know, see the data. So, you know, if you're slowing down. So for example, if your stroke rate is staying the same, but the power number is going down, you know, you're not applying the same amount of force. Um, and the same thing with the stroke rate, the stroke rate is falling down. So you, you have that feedback right in front of you, which you can't get in the water. And and the biggest thing is I think what most swimmers don't do is accelerate through the stroke. So the front end when you're catching, you know, at the catch, they're not accelerating all the way through the back of the stroke. They're kind of we call mono speed. They're kind of pulling at one rate of speed. And on the um, you know on the vasa, you can hear the difference as you accelerate. You can hear the whoosh of the the air going through there. Um, so I think it's a great thing to learn because it doesn't have to be for long workouts. Some people think they got to do 20, 30, 40 minute workouts, but you know doing um, you know a couple workouts a week of five to ten minutes working on skills and working on technique until your you know your form falls apart can really prove very valuable and, and for people who need to get more frequency in the pool. 
Well, that's all very uh, useful and helpful information. Tim Crowley is a longtime USAT triathlon coach. He's the strength and conditioning coach at Monteverde Academy in Florida, and he was my personal coach for over a decade and a very successful one. Tim, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today to discuss strength and conditioning for triathletes. Hi, welcome. And now it's time for the Triathlete Routard, that segment of the show when I am joined by a guest to discuss a race on the Ironman and Ironman 70.3 calendar that is a worthwhile spot to go to visit to race. For today's episode, I'm going to be talking about the races held north of my home city of Montreal, those in the beautiful Laurentian mountain town of Mont-Tremblant. And joining me to discuss these races is Catherine Kay. Kath is not only an accomplished triathlete, but also happens to be my sister-in-law. Kath lives outside of Toronto, Canada, and is a member of the Mac Attack Triathlon Club. She has raced numerous Ironman and 70.3 races across the continent and around the world, including the last two 70.3 World Championships. She raced Mont Tremblant 70.3 in 2017 and 2018, and the full Ironman in 2016. And this year is going to be racing the half in Mont Tremblant once again, before racing in Ironman Wisconsin in the fall. But she joins me now to talk about the Mont Tremblant races. Welcome, Catherine. Thanks, Jeff. Tell me, uh, the Mont Tremblant races are uh, very popular, and my understanding is that they sell out very quickly. So uh, what is the deal? How fast do you have to get in, or are you uh, likely to miss the boat? You have to sign up uh, right away, definitely the same day. Uh, it often sells out in a few hours. Um Often, uh, if you're part of a triathlon club, you have a link to register before it opens. So that's another way to get in. And this is really principally for the 70.3 race. I know that is the one that is super popular and goes sells out very, very quickly, correct? That's right. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, because I looked at the Ironman uh, site, and that race is actually still open, albeit at the most expensive tier, so probably approaching capacity at this point. But here we are recording this in mid-May, and uh, there is still availability for the Ironman race. The Ironman 70.3 has indeed been sold out for quite some time, although there are foundation slots available, those, of course, being significantly more expensive. Uh, what about getting there? Uh, Mont Tremblant, not the uh, easiest spot in the world to get to. So uh, is there the ability to fly in there? You can fly into Mont Tremblant. There's a small airport. I'm not sure what airline flies there. Um, and uh, it's not the, the flights aren't very frequent. Otherwise, the best bet is to fly into Montreal at Trudeau Airport and just rent a car and drive uh, it's about two hours to get to Tremblant. Now, one of the things I don't miss having left Montreal many years ago is Montreal traffic, especially traffic heading to the Laurentians. Uh, so that two hours is on the, you know, that's on the fast side. I, I can remember yeah. it taking significantly <laughs> longer, especially if you're going up towards a weekend. Um, when should people plan to get there? I usually How far try. advance of the race? I usually try to get there for the Thursday. Um, I just like to settle in and um, and enjoy the the vibe before the race. Otherwise, I would say definitely by Friday. And this is the kind of race, I mean, this is the kind of setting for a race that's really beautiful with a lot of things to do. Uh, if you're going with your family, I, I, I mean, I can't... S- you know, say strongly enough, this is the kind of place to take the family for a vacation and make a vacation around the race. Uh, I, I would encourage people to go for longer to get there before and just enjoy the area and enjoy the activities. And I know you and I have talked previously where you said that you actually like staying after the race as much as possible. I just find I'm more relaxed after the race. Um, but it's definitely, uh, very family friendly venue. Even during the race, they have things going on for the kids. Uh, sometimes it can be long, uh, even the three hours or two hours on your bike. Um, there's always things around the village to do for kids. They even have a race for the kids, uh, like most Ironman or half Ironman events, um, the day before the race. In terms of uh, lodging considerations, Uh, I know that uh, when the World Championships were there, I saw how local cottage owners really 
like took advantage of the race and of the participants of the race and really jacked up prices and also made pretty onerous demands in terms of uh, length of stay requirements. Is that something that continues with the regular 70.3 and Ironman races? Yes, it is. I find most places require three or even four night minimum stay. Uh, it is it is expensive to stay in the village, and I've never looked at prices outside the village, but it's definitely worth staying in the village, even if it's a bit more expensive, um, just for the convenience, and also just to experience the whole venue. It's it's just amazing. Yeah, that Moulton Blanc Village is really a really pretty place. They've done a fantastic job, the developers have, in terms of making it and developing it into a really world-class destination. And and I agree with you. Uh, there are a lot of cottages around that you can rent, but honestly, I, I when I looked at it, I didn't get a sense that I was going to save much money doing that. And just for sure, convenience of being able to stay within the resort, all of the restaurants that are available and uh, all of the other options available in terms of the lake being right there and uh, activities for the family. Uh, I, I kind of agree. Staying in the village is uh, definitely something that's worth uh, looking into and exploring. And there's certainly many, many options at all kinds of different price points, even though, as we've both said, they unfortunately tend to raise those rates quite dramatically when the race comes around. Uh, okay, so we've talked about how to get there. We've talked about where to stay. I think it's time to turn our attention to the course itself. So uh, the Ironman and the 70.3 share a lot in common. Uh, the uh, Ironman, whenever possible, simply doubles the distance by taking the 70.3 loop and doubling it. So let's start with the swim. Uh, what can you tell us about the swim? Where is it located? And uh, is there anything specific about it that people should be aware of? The swim is in uh, Lac Tremblant. Uh, it's a beautiful lake, very clean. Um, the course is, is very straightforward. It's rec rectangle, um, easy to sight. Um, the one thing I would recommend, because it is a bit of a hike if you're staying in the village, to get to the swim start. So just to make sure you give yourself enough time well before your wave starts or your rolling start starts to, um, to get to the start of the swim. Sun, does the sun ever become an issue? Uh, I know that in that part of the world, uh, sunrise can be very early, uh, but you've got, you're surrounded by mountains there, so I don't know if the sun ever becomes an issue with sighting. I've never had a problem uh, in the races I've done with, with sighting or in the sun being in, in your face, um, so I'm not sure about that. Sometimes there's a problem um, in August for the full with fog. Um, I think last year they had to delay the start because of fog. Okay. And that obviously more a problem in August when the nights can be significantly cooler and therefore in the morning you can get that fog over the lake. Uh, okay. And then, uh, you know, there's, I'm assuming it doesn't have the Lake Placid cable running the whole way to give you the nice length. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the Ironman, it, it's not too, it's not two laps with the beach exit. It's just a longer rectangle. That's right. Okay. Still, still a very nice, easy swim. Okay. Uh, once you're out of the water, uh, what is there to know about getting to T1? So the, the run from the water to T1 is quite lengthy. Um, they have changed. Last year, they changed the swim exit. Uh, so the run is not as long as it used to be, but it's still quite a, quite a ways to run to, into transition. However, it is lined with a nice red carpet, which is easier on your feet. Okay. Uh, now, uh, on my last episode, I had a guest and we talked about Lake Placid, a race that you've done as well, where the transition from the swim to the, uh, to the bike is also quite lengthy. Uh, how would you compare the two between Tremblant and Placid in terms of the length of the run required? So now that they've changed the exit, Tremblant would be a shorter transition. Okay. And, and again, like you said, carpeted. And uh, I think you've also told me in the past how lined with people and really like uh, very boisterous, uh, getting you really energized as you go from the water to your bike. For sure. It, there are tons of people lining the streets as you run from the swim to the transition. It's really fun. All right. Okay. So you get your bike and you're out onto the roads. Um, what can you tell us about the bike course? The bike course, uh, the roads are beautiful. 
um, beautifully paved roads. So a nice fast course. Uh, the majority is rolling, rolling hills uh, until the last maybe 15K. And um, you have a big, a big climb uh, on Duplessis. Yeah, so let's just give people a little more kind of detail of what's going on here. The the Ironman the seventy point three is one loop, ninety kilometers long. The Ironman does two loops of the exact same course. Uh, leaving transition, it is typical Laurentians with rolling hills. Uh, couple of longer climbs but nothing terribly steep and then you get on to highway 117 where you ride uh, a fairly straightforward course without a lot of elevation gain until you get to the town of La Belle. You turn around at La Belle, you come all the way back towards the town of Mont Tremblant but, but instead of going back into the town of Mont Tremblant, you turn onto the road that Kath just referred to which is uh, Duplessis and then once on Duplessis uh, it gets serious with uh, a significant climb of about 10 kilometers with an average gradient of 8%. So uh, not to be trifled with. If you're doing the 70.3, then you're looking at that right at the end of your ride. If you're doing this, uh, the Ironman, you're looking at that at the midway point and again at the end. Uh, how did you approach that in both of those races so that you would be able to you know, still have legs for the second loop of the ride on the Ironman, but also for the run? For the Ironman, um, I I didn't go about it uh, the right way. I went too hard on the first loop, and I went up Duplessis. It was okay. Then I went again. I went pretty hard on the second loop, and I had a really hard time getting up Duplessis. So my advice would be on the second loop to to, or definitely on the first loop, pace yourself. And the second loop, make sure you have fresh enough legs to get up that. Duplessis because it is tough in the second the second loop. Yeah, and that's a, that's that's that is not a like that's not a little <laughs> climb. That's, that's it's a, a big that's climb, a real climb. Yeah, that's <laughs> legit. Uh, that that I would say was one of the main reasons that Tremblant was awarded the World Championships for the seventy point three race was because of that climb on Duplessis made the bike ride that difficult because the rest of the bike and course that- is fast and not that hard. And then the nice part is uh, once you get to the top and you turn around, you have a nice downhill into transition. Right, and uh, you have that uh, you have that downhill twice on the Ironman. So, uh, what road conditions you mentioned earlier, you said really nice roads, nothing to be worried about. And if I recall, they actually close the roads to cars, so you're you're on you know it's just bikes on the roads and service marshals and things like that. Correct. That's right. It's it's very safe. Did you notice a lot of drafting in either of the races? Uh, uh, to my knowledge, drafting has never been an issue at Trombla. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would imagine with the rolling start and the fact that they have, you know, that pretty significant climb that probably breaks up the pack. So that's a good thing. Uh, course is pretty easy to understand. Very straightforward. And then what about any danger points? They So going down Duplessis, uh, as you can imagine, um, the speeds can go up to 60 kilometers an hour on your bike. Um, so they have introduced two no-passing zones uh, on that hill. One is on a bridge, and the other one is one small section on Duplessis, where you're absolutely not allowed to pass anyone going downhill. And, uh, you know, riders often get frustrated by that, but those no-passing zones are there for a reason. My understanding is there was a pretty significant pileup a few years ago. I think the year you did the Ironman, actually. That's right. And uh, I was there when the director, the race director, introduced the no-passing zone, and um, we everyone everyone who was there supported his decision. Yeah. So, I mean, those things are, you know, sometimes we take them in isolation and we get frustrated by them. But the fact of the matter is that they're based on safety and they're really there to keep everyone upright and having a, a good day. So, uh, you know, just uh, remember to do that and it's not going to it's not going to delay you too much. Uh, OK, so and they're very strict on that as well. Yeah, I, I understand. I mean, they have marshals right there just watching it. Yes. OK. All right, so you've managed Duplessis once if you're in the 70.3, twice if you're doing the Ironman, and now you're coming back to transition. Is transition in the same location as uh, was T1? Uh, Yes, it is. Okay, and then you're out onto the run. So 
What can you tell us about the run course? Every time I do the run, I always forget how hilly it is. It is a challenging run course. Uh, it's it starts off and and, and the seventy point three is what the seventy point three is one loop and the iron is right. two correct yeah of the same course. All right. Um, it's it's definitely um, it, there are there are some good hills. Um, but there are lots of volunteers along the way, lots of people cheering you on, and it's very scenic. I know that, you know, the hill I'm familiar with is the one that goes up through the heart of town, and that is, again, not an insignificant one. That that comes at the end of each loop. Uh, there's obviously a lot of other ones that are out there on the course that I haven't seen. I imagine uh, in some, it's uh, a definite leg beater. For sure. You you have to pace yourself on the run in that in that race. But the payoff uh, is that when you get to the summit at the top of the the town after that long grueling climb, uh, you get a downhill to one of the best finish areas that I've ever seen in Ironman. It is amazing. So you go up that final hill towards the chapel, and once you turn the corner, it's just lined with people, and you can hear them from a kilometer from the finish and it just pumps you to the end. And it is one of the best finishes I've ever done. It doesn't matter if it's half or the full, it's an amazing experience. Yeah. I've, I mean, I was there for worlds. I didn't get to participate cause I was injured, but, uh, I saw that and, uh, I definitely remember what a, a spectacle it was. So yeah, I can, and they've done a great job at, at like dressing up the village to really make that finish area really something else. It's also great for spectators because people can actually be sitting at restaurants on the patio cheering people on. We talk a lot about destinations, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, I mean, a great place to go visit for a race, especially if you're going with a family. Uh, I always encourage people to take their time and uh, stay before or after this race. What kind of uh, activities are there for people to do uh, if they do decide to take advantage of the area? There are tons of family-friendly fr family friendly activities in the area. There's hiking. Um, there are many lakes within walking distance from the village uh, to do any sort of water activity. Uh, there's treetop trekking, anything you can imagine. It's, it's, you'll never run out of things to do. Yeah. And, and I, I remember I didn't do it, but the treetop trekking was something I heard about and heard a lot of positive things. There's the Petit Train de Nord, which is uh, an old rail line that's been converted to a bike path that runs for hundreds of kilometers and uh, connects to the village. Actually, you run on that as part of the run course, don't you? Yes, you do. Yeah. So uh, you'll see part of that as you do the race and then you can actually, that's a great family-friendly bike uh, ride to do for as long as your kids are able. Um, and then there's lots of mountain biking and, like you said, water sports. It really is a terrific area. Uh, when we think about this race, uh, both in June and in August, we do have to consider the fact that weather can be fickle up there. What kind of uh, weather have you had for these days? When I did the full, it was pouring rain the entire day. Um, so that was challenging. Uh, the two halves I did, uh, the weather was pretty good. The water can be chilly, uh, definitely for the half. Um, so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, so you never know what the weather's going to be like. Yeah, and I would say that there are two certainties about this race. Number one, it's always going to be wetsuit legal because in June that water is definitely going to be brisk and in August mm -hmm. it still won't have warmed up that much. Uh, and uh, then the weather is going to be entirely unpredictable. Every time I follow the weather leading up to that race, be it in the spring or in the late summer, it seems like the forecast will change day to day leading up to the race. And so any forecast you see is not entirely uh, trustworthy. So like you said, you could have rain and cool weather or you can have really baking hot sun the entire time. And it's kind of, you just go and hope for the best and bring with you your best effort and hope the weather participates and, and allows that to happen. Great. Any other final parting words for uh, our listeners about these races? Well, I just want to say that the volunteers uh, at Tremblant are amazing. The 
whole community gets involved and it's just an amazing experience to do that race. The venue is great. Um, they have a, a stage playing music all day. It's just, it's definitely a race that you want to put on your list. All right. Well, Catherine Kay is not just an accomplished triathlete and a participant at uh, two 70.3 World Championships. She's also my sister-in-law. And today was uh, a pleasure to have her as my guest on the Triathlete Route Talk to talk about the Ironman and Ironman 70.3 races at Mont Tremblant, Quebec. Thanks for being here today, Kath. Thanks for having me, Jeff. And that's it for another episode of the TriDoc Podcast. I hope that you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Links to the medical references as well as to everything else discussed on the show can be found in the show notes at www.tridocpodcast.podbean.com. I have new content on my TriDoc Coaching YouTube channel. Please take a look to see my review and thoughts on the Nike 4% Vaporfly shoes. Are these $250 ultra-light, ultra-techy shoes all they're cracked up to be? Type T-R-I-D-O-C, no space, in the YouTube search bar to find my channel. And don't forget to subscribe so you'll be up to date as new content becomes available. If you have feedback or a question for consideration to be answered on the program, please email me at T-R-I underscore D-O-C at iCloud.com. Are you interested in coaching services and taking your racing and training to the next level? Well, visit www.tridoccoaching.com, where you can find a lot of information about me and the services that I provide. The music heard at the beginning and the end of the show is Radio by Empty Hours and is used with permission. This song and many others like it can be found at www.reverbnation.com, where I hope that you'll go visit and give small, independent bands a chance. The Tridoc Podcast will be back again soon. With another listener question for me to answer, an interview with Megan Hotman, the cyclist lawyer, and another episode of the Triathlete Retard, with a guide to the Ironman and 70.3 races in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Until then, train hard, train healthy.